In order to get centered, I would like to uh, start with the Lord's Prayer uh, in Aramaic. So, if you'd like that. And my course students, please help with the English translation. Let me get started. So anyway, this is the Lord's Prayer, and it's in Aramaic, which is the language that Jesus spoke. So hopefully you can kind of get a flavor of it. Your private, your private, one on your. I'm trying to find it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me now? Well, no, I'm saying you're right behind the camera. I'm to one side. Okay, here we go. So this is to help us get centered. So let's let's think of it in those terms, okay? Aun tu eshmiya net karashmak tarate malkuta nekwe sebiyana e kanendwashmiya a parwa howl and lakma soon kanu yomana wash woken how bein. E kanera kanan shakla nil hayawain Ula tala enisiona Ella pasan membisha Meto de la ki maukutha U haila U tishbukta La alam almin Amen Our Father in universe Hallowed be thy name Come, thy kingdom, let be thy wishes, as in universe, so in earth. Give us bread our need today, and release us our offenses, as we release too our offenders. And do not let us into worldliness, but part us from error, for thine is kingdom, power and glory, from ages to ages, sealed in faith, trust, and truth. And so it is. So I got a question for you. You guys like that prayer? Yeah. We've been kicking around the idea with the board, trying to make, come up with things that we can do as a congregation that's a little more experiential and, and added to, to the service. And we thought if you would like to learn this prayer, that we would have it printed up and maybe laminated, you know, so that um, we could all say it as a congregation, you know, and I would be glad to help lead that. I'm not gonna, we're not going to make you feel like you've got to read or make or anything like that. But, um, and I've, I've already started a draft on it, and, you know, it's not the actual spelling like it would be with the... Uh, um, actual Aramaic, but more toned out so it's easier to say for the phonic that, that I use the way that I learned it. So I think you guys would be receptive to something like that. Is that cool? Okay. I think you'll find it fun. Um, we did this at our church in Denver, and we said it as a congregation. And when you say it together and you say it, you know, with many people, it, it really has a nice resonance to it and um, I think you'll enjoy it. So anyway, good. That's off the table. <coughs> and so on with the talk. Did anybody have a sense of something strange in the room when they came in this morning? I mean, kind of strange. I mean, I thought I sensed an elephant in the room. I mean, maybe it's just me. You know, I don't know. It could be that gray thing sitting up there. Could be the topic of the talk. I don't know. There's an elephant in the room. I'm pretty sure. Um, I'm anybody who knows me knows that I'm I'm pretty fond of A Course in Miracles, and uh, that's kind of been my chosen study. It's what I love, and um, so that's going to be most of what this this talk is. And as beautiful as the course is, and I know there's probably maybe some of you that have tried it in the past, uh, maybe found it a little too wordy or 
difficult to understand for whatever reason you tried it and you just it just didn't resonate and you walked away from it but mostly because usually it just seems like it's kind of difficult to read difficult to understand and granted it certainly does have its its way um, I mean when I got into it I was really in a, in a group that was uh, pretty dedicated and committed to what it was going to take to actually study the course and that's what really what the course is. it's a course it has a text it has a workbook it's got the manual I mean it's meant to be you know a study thing you have to dive into it so a lot of people walk away from it because once they get into it they're going it's just not I, I want to read more you know easier stuff and everything so um, and I'm only bringing this up because when we're going to be doing our Course in Miracles group after uh, we finish Eckhart Tolle, we're going to be using a book. Um, we call it the White Book. Okay? And it's the message of A Course in Miracles, a translation of the text in plain language. So there's a lot of material out there around A Course in Miracles that, you know, uh, commentaries and whatnot, thousands of books. But um, this I, we have found to really bring a lot to the table as far as being able to read and go, oh, okay, that's nice. And so I just wanted to throw that out there as an offer that if anybody who had thought about that, they'd like to do A Course in Miracles again? Yeah. Would you explain to the congregation how the book Course in Miracles is related? You know, how it was written? Well, yeah, I mean, if. I mean, in a nutshell, okay, um, about the Course in Miracles, that um, it was written in the 60s into the 70s by this lady who heard a voice after a series of events. Um, she was a clinical psychologist at Columbia University, and she had a colleague. Life was not going as well as it should have for clinical psychologists at a college, and they were just overwhelmed with you know all the negativity and everything that was going on in, in the world and in their lives. And one day, her compadre said, "I've had it." Said, "There has got to be a better way." And it's like that. It dawned on her. She goes, "I will help you." And like I said, after a series of events, I'm not going to go into the whole introduction, but after a series of events, she heard a voice that said, this is a course in miracles, please take notes. And seven years later, a text and a workbook and the manual went through a series of events that allowed it to get published and enter the domain for us. It's miraculous. I mean, and the idea, this voice that came to her, is Jesus. And to me, that was pretty intriguing. I mean, I've, I've been a Jesus fan for a long time. And, um, and when I got into New Thought, uh, it kind of brought a whole other level of understandings of things about Jesus and about the Jesus type of people. Um, that really opened a lot of you know avenues in my life for you know exploring that, and um, especially compared to what I the Jesus I was raised with, you know I mean I was early on you gotta believe in Jesus. I mean, okay, easy enough I think you know let's go with that, um, and so there you got into that and but. It also had its, you know, had its ups and downs. I mean, yes, this is a good thing to have in your back pocket when you're feeling good, and you maybe have some decisions to make or whatever. But, you know, it didn't come without its, its bit of baggage as well. I mean, because at first it's believing in him, you're going, well, like, why? Because he loves you. Okay, that's good. I can, I can buy into that, and then. Now that you believe him, it's like you've got to accept him into your heart. Okay, <laughs> easy enough, I think. That's a good thing. And then it became, wow, this guy's with me all the time. It was nice once in a while. 
and I like it when it's good, but you know, I need some space once in a while. And I didn't sense that, <laughs> you know, that there was that space. That now there's this voice that's going whoop, 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 all the time. And when you're young, you know, like I was, I mean, this was hard to, you know, deal with. But um, so I wanted to go be with my friends and do things maybe he wasn't going to be so proud of. And now I'm being taught, you know, and I'll, I'll come clean. The, the, I had a Southern Baptist upbringing, man, so we're getting hammered. And, you know, now they've entered the word sin into the mix. You know, and this was huge. And I'm going, what, where did that come from? I mean, what, what exactly is that? And so they give you a, a big thing. And um, it's a funny thing, that word sin. I was thinking about this when I was doing, thinking about the talk. Everybody pretty well knows what sin means. I mean, that, that definition, that it, it's a, an archery term, right? That's really what the word was. It was an archery term. It meant you, you missed the target. You aimed and you shot and you missed the target. You fell short. That is what the word means. And I thought to myself, can you imagine what the person who invented that word would think about how that word got turned into whatever it got turned into and the influence it's had through history. How many lives have been ruined, whatever, affected, we can at least go that far, with the idea that, oh my God, this thing is an attack against God. It has its own thing and it's not good and there are consequences. I feel terrible for that person <laughs> thinking that, oh, I just wanted to say, you know, geez, this is a term. But what a deal, huh? I mean, the word sin, you think about that. And, and Course in Miracles, when it talks about sin, it's, that's, that's a biggie. I mean, that's, that's one of those old tapes, you know, that we get caught into. And it's a word, man. It's a definition of an event. But this event doesn't have good consequences, right? And so... One of the beauties of the Course in Miracles is how it takes the same language that we use all the time and yet it gives words different meanings so that we can go, oh, maybe that's a better way to look at things. And breaking it down into simplistic things such as, the Course says that everything, every thought, every action we have on some level it's a call for love, or it's an extension of love. Either or. Pretty simple stuff, man. That's, I like that. I, okay, course. Just give, me, give it to me simply. So, take the word like attack. We think of that word as something that vicious, you know, that's on purpose. It's, you know, meant to do no good and all that stuff. It has its own Webster's definition and something that's been drilled into our minds what this word represents. You go to the either or, of course. Well, it doesn't seem like an extension of love. I mean, the word's still there, the act's still there, but it doesn't qualify there. And there's only one other option, right? If everything is either or, the option is we have to look at it. That's a call for love. Wow. That's a whole new dimension to things. So that's what the Course is really all about. It's about trying to get us to realize that all the things, the negativities, the, 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 the words that we've been saturated with, that we use, I mean, think about it, man. We use words to think. When we're thinking, we're thinking in terms of sentences and names and their words. Everything that we do is based on words and mental words. And so we can change that. And when we think about our world, it's like you know, Wayne Dyer was always talking about, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. That's what a course is. It's asking us to change what we think we're seeing. We think we're seeing guilt and jealousy and all these other things, sin, of course. And all of those things are words that we're associating with in an ego world. That's what we do. And that's kind of what this talk is about. I know that's kind of a, a strong statement to have as a title for a talk. OK? 
Okay? The ego always speaks first. That is found in chapter five of the Course and in, in Time and Eternity. And I just found it intriguing. You know, when I heard when I read that, I'm going, wow, no kidding. It says Basically what I was saying is we always listen to two voices. We have two voices that are always talking to us all the time. We're either, it's either the ego or spirit. And it's happening all the time. Does it seem like it all the time? It's happening all the time. Those are the two options we have. So, and it says that these two voices are talking to us all the time simultaneously. However, with the exception that the ego always speaks first. Because we talk about the ego here once in a while. We throw it up in conversation. It's mostly, to me, it's brought up in terms of it's some sort of anomaly. It's some sort of momentary lapse of you know, concentration. This thing's just kind of booted in there and, and is challenging our spiritual discernment. You know, and I'll get over it, but it's certainly the exception and not the rule. I mean, we're spiritual. <laughs> you know, we're on top of this game. Not so much. Not so much. I mean, the Course tells us this world, this existence that we have, this physicality thing that we believe we're looking at and participating in, that's the domain of the ego. Okay, we're on the ego's home court. All right? And that's just the way it is. And the, and the proof is, is if you're going to be looking, defining God, if you will, God is love, right? We don't have a problem defining God like that. Unconditional love. And the Course says, absolutely, God is love. God is only love. And God is the extension of love. Well, love's not a thing. It's not a tangible thing. Love is love. But we live in a world that we have to touch things, that we look out and we see things. We live in a world that the Course calls a world of separation. And all we have to, we got everything we need to experience that. We got sight, we got touch, we got smell, we hear it. Everything that, that we look out on the world, that physicality is screaming to us, it's ego. Because it's separate from God. It is a separate thing from God. So this is like our little playground. I mean, and why the Course? What is the message of the Course? To look past that. That's how we grow. We see things for what they are. We see that they're out there. It's happening. But what is it really? The Course tells us that everything that we give meaning to is a meaning we have given the meaning to. Everything we see, we're identifying with it. And that's what we do all the time. We're identifying, we're defining everything that we think is happening. And if we think we don't do that, I mean, think of how you got here this morning. Right? First thing, and you get up and you go, what time is it? Now we're subject to time. What am I going to wear? What are people going to think? You know, it's, it just goes and goes and goes on the way here. Somebody get in your way in traffic. We think we're not thinking in ego terms, but we're talking in terms of either or. It's either or. And if you have anything that is not bringing you peace of mind, and that is the crux of the Course. The Course says to us that its goal is not enlightenment, its goal is peace. And why would that be so important unless we don't have it? There's a need to find a way to, to get this peace. And it is through identifying what we think is real. We think things like attack are real. We identify it immediately. And all those things. So I'm just saying that for A Course in Miracles, for anybody who might want to come to our class and participate with the White Book and that kind of stuff, that's the kind of things we talk about. How to identify what we think is going on. Okay. Um, thanks, Steve. That had nothing to do with what I was going to be talking about, but what a nice little ramble job that was, right? <clears throat> so anyway, I came up with this problem. I wanted to share with you that uh, that was nice. Um, this phrase comes from the White Book. Okay, 
And it is throughout the white book, uh, almost every page probably. Because when we're talking about what we need to do in order to get to the peace that God wants us to have, right? We've got to start looking at things differently and identifying them, correct? So I want some audience participation here. I would like for everybody to repeat this, if you would, aloud. And we're going to do it three times. Because I want you to, if nothing else, hopefully you'll walk out of here with some sort of little jingle or a thought that you can take out the doors and think about once in a while. So anyway, everybody ready for this? All together? The correction of the perception of the separation from God. The correction of the perception of the separation from God. One more time. The correction of the perception of the separation from God. That's a correction. We think we perceive we're separate from God. That is the number one foundational basic issue when it comes to our spiritual thinking in life. We think we're separate. This is telling us that can be corrected. Okay? Key word, perception. Everything we do is about perception. Everything that enters our minds, everything. We're always, man, we're just defining machines. We like to judge, you know, and we live in a world, this little W world, that of course called little W, or it's Renee, which would be the little R real world, with a little less self looking at it. So it's all about perception. We're seeing, we're identifying, and we're interpreting, and that's, in that interpretation, we have to decide on some level, is my interpretation bringing me peace? Do I feel at peace with this? If you don't, there's another way to look at it. And of course, says, that's the Holy Spirit. We ask the Holy Spirit, please help me see this differently. Give me an option. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. Okay, so we're talking about, and, and that's what the Course calls, the, the, one of the definitions of a miracle in the Course, one of the foundational definitions is, it's a shift in perception. That's a miracle. It's not walking on water, it's not feeding 5,000 and above the loaf of bread. It's none of that kind of stuff. That's all physical stuff. This is about a shift in perception. What I thought was happening was not happening. This is what was behind it. It was a call for love. And now what do I do about that? What do you do when you sense a call for love? As the Course says, you have to answer with love. But you've got to identify it. And so that's what I like about the Course too. Is I, it's given me the tools in my toolbox to, to have all of these little concepts, these ideas, like extension of love, call for love. It's loaded with those. So again, for those that, that have this impression the course is hard and it's you know, getting into and, and it's you know, so wordy and everything, I want you to know there's a lot of, on the flip side of that coin, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, okay? I mean, you can go through the course and go, oh, I can take that. Things about forgiveness and, and other, other concepts is going, okay, that isn't so bad. I can, I can run with that, you know? Teach no one that he is what you want to be, for your brother is the mirror in which you see the image of yourself. Wow, that's pretty cool. It's like, no you know. Be the Christ in me, see the Christ in you stuff. It's full of them. We have a box that we start our classes with, and it's just nothing but a, a bunch of cards with all these profound statements on it. It's loaded with them. So, anyway, once again, I would encourage you. Should I lose that? Yeah. This must be an ego mic, man. It does not, it does not want you to play. It is not an attack. It's not an attack, I know. It's my little mic's call for love. So, okay, I know we got to move on here. Um, another statement to go along just to kind of 
help qualify with this. Um, this is from the introduction of the course, um, and I'm just going to read it. But um, it says, the course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love, for that is beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. Key. Removing the blocks to our awareness of love's presence. Love's presence, that's another way of saying, in whatever situation, love is always present. It doesn't look like it's there, but it's there. Maybe it may be there in a call, okay? A call for love, but it's there. Love is all there really is. Anything that's not of love is just the fear of not seeing it, okay? Of course, says, what is not love is always fear. Well, what do we define fear as, right? We use that acronym all the time. You know, false evidence appearing real, right? Well, the absence of love is false evidence appearing real. Love's still there. We just need to, to look at and find a way to find that in the situation. That's how we're going to have peace. We can only have it when it's, we can share it and we can identify what peace is not. That's how we find peace. Anything that doesn't seem like peace, there's got to be another way to look at this. The Course says, I could have peace instead of this. That's one of the little things in the, in the lessons. Okay. Um, so we've got established love is always present there somewhere. It's just that we put blocks in the way. Again, words, world, physical, all the, what, what car do I drive, what clothes do I wear, all the stuff that, that's around the ego, okay? So um, that's what we need to do. We need to recognize what is not love, what is not a part of it, and then we can start down the trail of going, oh, okay, there's another way to look at this. And that's what the course is about. There's another way to look at things. So. Um, after I got off that side talk, I was just going to say, when I was thinking about these, uh, uh, these thoughts and, and everything, it, it occurred to me, I was, I was thinking about, you ever heard how uh, you can tie a baby elephant up to a stake, right? And as it grows older, you can take the rope off and the elephant won't venture very far from that stake. It still thinks it's tied to a stake, right? And I thought, that is so much like, like us in this world. We are like this spiritual, we're the elephant. And yet, we're tied to this stake of little w world, the stake of things that have accomplishments. You know, what kind of degrees do you have, and what kind of job do you have, how many children you got, are they best, and all these things that we want to consider our life. It's my life, I'm, it's personal, it's, you know, and I'll judge anybody who doesn't think so. <laughs> so we have this thing being thrown out there all the time. The ego is always speaking first, okay? It's telling us, hey, you're tied to this world, and you got to do this. Besides, just take a look at yourself. Look who you are. You're a man. You're a woman. You're a child. You're this. You're we all the definitions that we want to throw out there that of what we are, other than when we talk about we like to throw this around too, right? Am I a human having a spiritual experience, or am I a spirit having a human experience? Oh no, I'm a spirit having a human experience. Right. Right. We try. Don't get me wrong, we try. But we live in the ego's playground, and we've got to find that. And, and moment and moment and moment again. Because in the ego's domain, that's where we're playing. It's always speaking first, and we can look and try to look at the blocks to our awareness of love's presence. Okay, The major block in all of that is the belief that we we have a perception of the separation from God, and that's the answer. We've got to have a correction for that perception, okay? So, anyway, in closing, I thought I would, uh, God, there's that elephant again. 
You guys sense that? Okay, just me. Um, anyway, I want to finish with one of my favorite stories, a little parable. Maybe you've heard it. It's, it's about the, the kingdom a long time ago, once upon a time in this kingdom. Um, there was this king and queen that, that ran this kingdom, and everybody loved them. They were just wonderful and congenial, and people just loved being a part of the kingdom. The only issue was that they had a son, and the, the prince, and the son wasn't near as congenial. He was kind of uppity and, and never treated the people all that well and everything. He's the prince. Well, unfortunately, a plague comes through the county, the country, and a lot of the people died in the kingdom. Along with them, the king and queen. And the people that were left didn't know what to do with the prince. He survived. And they thought, you know what? They got together and decided, we love the king and queen so much, we're going to give this child an opportunity to you know, see what he can do. So they went to him. They approached him and said, look, this is the deal. We are willing to give you a chance, okay? Because we loved your mom and dad so much. So what we're going to do is we're going to place you in the palace for a year by yourself, and we expect something at the end of this year for you to be able to have accomplished something that will help us have trust and faith in you. So as the year goes on, the prince is walking up, and he doesn't know what to do. He's always been catered all his life. And he walks by this room, and he sees this huge stone sitting in the room, and he didn't have anything else to do. And so he went and found some tools, and he started chipping away at this stone. So a year passes by, and the people come and said, OK, what's up? We need to know what, what you've accomplished and why we should put our faith in. He goes, I, I didn't have, have anything really. He says, I've just been working on this stone in this room. And they said, well, show it to us. And they went and they looked in. And it was an immaculate statue of an elephant. I mean, to the finest details, hair, everything was just perfect. They were amazed. And they said, how in the world did you accomplish this? You didn't have any talent for this. And he goes, I just chipped away everything that didn't look like an elephant. <laughs> That's us, okay? The elephants is that love that's always present. It was in there. What we do is chip away the stones, the obstacles to find love's presence. That's the elephant in the room, okay? That's the one. All right. All right. Namaste. Namaste.